Title 3. Board of Directors slash Trustees and Officers. Section 23. The Board of Directors or Trustees. Unless otherwise provided in this code, the corporate powers of all corporations formed under this code shall be exercised, all business conducted and all property of such corporations controlled and held by the board of directors or trustees to be elected from among the holders of stocks, or where there is no stock, from among the members of the corporation, who shall hold office for one, one, year until their successors are elected and qualified. 2A. Every director must own at least one, one, share of the capital stock of the corporation of which he is a director, which share shall stand in his name on the books of the corporation. Any director who ceases to be the owner of at least one, one, share of the capital stock of the corporation of which he is a director shall thereby cease to be a director. Trustees of non-stock corporations must be members thereof. A majority of the directors or trustees of all corporations organized under this code must be residents of the Philippines. Section 24. Election of Directors or Trustees. At all elections of directors or trustees, there must be present, either in person or by representative authorized to act by written proxy, the owners of a majority of the outstanding capital stock, or if there be no capital stock, a majority of the members entitled to vote. The election must be by ballot if requested by any voting stockholder or member. In stock corporations, every stockholder entitled to vote shall have the right to vote in person or by proxy the number of shares of stock standing, at the time fixed in the bylaws, in his own name on the stock books of the corporation, or where the bylaws are silent, at the time of the election, and said stockholder may vote such number of shares for as many persons as there are directors to be elected or he may accumulate said shares and give one candidate as many votes as the number of directors to be elected multiplied by the number of his shares shall equal, or he may distribute them on the same principle among as many candidates as he shall see fit, provided, that the total number of votes cast by him shall not exceed the number of shares owned by him as shown in the books of the corporation multiplied by the whole number of directors to be elected, provided, however, that no delinquent stock shall be voted. Unless otherwise provided in the Articles of Incorporation or in the bylaws, members of corporations which have no capital stock may cast as many votes as there are trustees to be elected but may not cast more than one vote for one candidate. Candidates receiving the highest number of votes shall be declared elected. Any meeting of the stockholders or members called for an election may adjourn from day to day or from time to time but not signed die or indefinitely if, for any reason, no election is held, or if there are not present or represented by proxy, at the meeting, the owners of a majority of the outstanding capital stock, or if there be no capital stock, a majority of the members entitled to vote. 31A. Section 25. Corporate Officers, Quorum. Immediately after their election, the directors of a corporation must formally organize by the election of a president, who shall be a director, a treasurer who may or may not be a director, a secretary who shall be a resident and citizen of the Philippines, and such other officers as may be provided for in the bylaws. Any two, two, or more positions may be held concurrently by the same person, except that no one shall act as president and secretary or as president and treasurer at the same time. The directors or trustees and officers to be elected shall perform the duties enjoined on them by law and the bylaws of the corporation. Unless the Articles of Incorporation or the bylaws provide for a greater majority, a majority of the number of directors or trustees as fixed in the Articles of Incorporation shall constitute a quorum for the transaction of corporate business, and every decision of at least a majority of the directors or trustees present at a meeting at which there is a quorum shall be valid as a corporate act, except for the election of officers which shall require the vote of a majority of all the members of the board. Directors or trustees cannot attend or vote by proxy at board meetings. 33A. Section 26. Report of Election of Directors, Trustees, and Officers. Within 30, 30, days after the election of the directors, trustees, and officers of the corporation, the secretary, or any other officer of the corporation, 
shall submit to the Securities and Exchange Commission the names, nationalities, and residences of the directors, trustees, and officers elected. Should a director, trustee, or officer die, resign or in any manner cease to hold office, his heirs in case of his death, the secretary, or any other officer of the corporation, or the director, trustee, or officer himself, shall immediately report such fact to the Securities and Exchange Commission. N. Section 27. Disqualification of directors, trustees, or officers. No person convicted by final judgment of an offense punishable by imprisonment for a period exceeding six, six, years, or a violation of this code committed within five, five, years prior to the date of his election or appointment, shall qualify as a director, trustee, or officer of any corporation. N. Section 28. Removal of Directors or Trustees. Any director or trustee of a corporation may be removed from office by a vote of the stockholders holding or representing at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the outstanding capital stock, or if the corporation be a non-stock corporation, by a vote of at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the members entitled to vote, provided, that such removal shall take place either at a regular meeting of the corporation or at a special meeting called for the purpose, and in either case, after previous notice to stockholders or members of the corporation of the intention to propose such removal at the meeting. A special meeting of the stockholders or members of a corporation for the purpose of removal of directors or trustees, or any of them, must be called by the secretary on order of the president or on the written demand of the stockholders representing or holding at least a majority of the outstanding capital stock, or, if it be a non-stock corporation, on the written demand of a majority of the members entitled to vote. Should the secretary fail or refuse to call the special meeting upon such demand or fail or refuse to give the notice, or if there is no secretary, the call for the meeting may be addressed directly to the stockholders or members by any stockholder or member of the corporation signing the demand. Notice of the time and place of such meeting, as well as of the intention to propose such removal, must be given by publication or by written notice prescribed in this code. Removal may be with or without cause, provided, that removal without cause may not be used to deprive minority stockholders or members of the right of representation to which they may be entitled under Section 24 of this Code. N. Section 29. Vacancies in the Office of Director or Trustee. Any vacancy occurring in the Board of Directors or Trustees other than by removal by the stockholders or members or by expiration of term, may be filled by the vote of at least a majority of the remaining directors or trustees, if still constituting a quorum, otherwise, said vacancies must be filled by the stockholders in a regular or special meeting called for that purpose. A director or trustee so elected to fill a vacancy shall be elected only or the unexpired term of his predecessor in office. Any directorship or trusteeship to be filled by reason of an increase in the number of directors or trustees shall be filled only by an election at a regular or at a special meeting of stockholders or members duly called for the purpose, or in the same meeting authorizing the increase of directors or trustees if so stated in the notice of the meeting. N. Section 30. Compensation of Directors. In the absence of any provision in the bylaws fixing their compensation, the directors shall not receive any compensation, as such directors, except for reasonable per diems, provided, however, that any such compensation other than per diems may be granted to directors by the vote of the stockholders representing at least a majority of the outstanding capital stock at a regular or special stockholders meeting. In no case shall the total yearly compensation of directors, as such directors, exceed 10, 10 percent, percent of the net income before income tax of the corporation during the preceding year. N. Section 31. Liability of directors, trustees, or officers. 
directors or trustees who willfully and knowingly vote for or assent to patently unlawful acts of the corporation or who are guilty of gross negligence or bad faith in directing the affairs of the corporation or acquire any personal or pecuniary interest in conflict with their duty as such directors or trustees shall be liable jointly and severally for all damages resulting therefrom suffered by the corporation, its stockholders, or members and other persons. When a director, trustee, or officer attempts to acquire or acquire, in violation of his duty, any interest adverse to the corporation in respect of any matter which has been reposed in him in confidence, as to which equity imposes a disability upon him to deal in his own behalf, he shall be liable as a trustee for the corporation and must account for the profits which otherwise would have accrued to the corporation. N. Section 32 Dealings of directors, trustees, or officers with the corporation. A contract of the corporation with one or more of its directors or trustees or officers is voidable, at the option of such corporation, unless all the following conditions are present. 1. That the presence of such director or trustee in the board meeting in which the contract was approved was not necessary to constitute a quorum for such meeting. 2. That the vote of such director or trustee was not necessary for the approval of the contract. 3. That the contract is fair and reasonable under the circumstances, and 4. That in case of an officer, the contract has been previously authorized by the board of directors. Where any of the first two conditions set forth in the preceding paragraph is absent, in the case of a contract with a director or trustee, such contract may be ratified by the vote of the stockholders representing at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the outstanding capital stock or of at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the members in a meeting called for the purpose, provided, that full disclosure of the adverse interest of the directors or trustees involved is made at such meeting, provided, however, that the contract is fair and reasonable under the circumstances. N. Section 33. Contracts between corporations with interlocking directors. Except in cases of fraud, and provided the contract is fair and reasonable under the circumstances, a contract between two or more corporations having interlocking directors shall not be invalidated on that ground alone, provided, that if the interest of the interlocking director in one corporation is substantial and his interest in the other corporation or corporations is merely nominal, he shall be subject to the provisions of the preceding section insofar as the latter corporation or corporations are concerned. Stock holding succeeding 20, 20%, 20 percent of the outstanding capital stock shall be considered substantial for purposes of interlocking directors. N. Section 34. Disloyalty of a director. Where a director, by virtue of his office, acquires for himself a business opportunity which should belong to the corporation, thereby obtaining profits to the prejudice of such corporation, he must account to the latter for all such profits by refunding the same, unless his act has been ratified by a vote of the stockholders owning or representing at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the outstanding capital stock. This provision shall be applicable, notwithstanding the fact that the director risked his own funds in the venture. N. Section 35. Executive Committee. The bylaws of a corporation may create an executive committee, composed of not less than three members of the board, to be appointed by the board. Said committee may act, by majority vote of all its members, on such specific matters within the competence of the board, as may be delegated to it in the bylaws or on a majority vote of the board, except with respect to, 1 approval of any action for which shareholders' approval is also required, 2, the filing of vacancies in the board, 3, the amendment or repeal of bylaws or the adoption of new bylaws, 4, the amendment or repeal of any resolution of the board which by its express terms is not so amendable or repealable, and, 5, a distribution of cash dividends to the shareholders. Title 4. Powers of Corporations. Section 36. Corporate Powers and Capacity. Every corporation incorporated under this code has the power and capacity. 1. To sue and be sued in its corporate name. 2. 
of succession by its corporate name for the period of time stated in the Articles of Incorporation and the Certificate of Incorporation. 3. To adopt and use a corporate seal. 4. To amend its Articles of Incorporation in accordance with the provisions of this code. 5. To adopt bylaws, not contrary to law, morals, or public policy, and to amend or repeal the same in accordance with this code. 6. In case of stock corporations, to issue or sell stocks to subscribers and to sell stocks to subscribers and to sell treasury stocks in accordance with the provisions of this code, and to admit members to the corporation if it be a non-stock corporation. 7. To purchase, receive, take, or grant, hold, convey, sell, lease, pledge, mortgage and otherwise deal with such real and personal property, including securities and bonds of other corporations, as the transaction of the lawful business of the corporation may reasonably and necessarily require, subject to the limitations prescribed by law and the Constitution. 8. To enter into merger or consolidation with other corporations as provided in this code. 9. To make reasonable donations, including those for the public welfare or for hospital, charitable, cultural, scientific, civic, or similar purposes, provided, that no corporation, domestic or foreign, shall give donations in aid of any political party or candidate or for purposes of partisan political activity. 10. To establish pension, retirement, and other plans for the benefit of its directors, trustees, officers and employees, and 11. To exercise such other powers as may be essential or necessary to carry out its purpose or purposes as stated in the Articles of Incorporation. 13a. Section 37. Power to extend or shorten corporate term. A private corporation may extend or shorten its term as stated in the Articles of Incorporation when approved by a majority vote of the Board of Directors or Trustees and ratified at a meeting by the stockholders representing at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the outstanding capital stock or by at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the members in case of non-stock corporations. Written notice of the proposed action and of the time and place of the meeting shall be addressed to each stockholder or member at his place of residence as shown on the books of the corporation and deposited to the addressee in the post office with postage prepaid, or served personally, provided, that in case of extension of corporate term, any dissenting stockholder may exercise his appraisal right under the conditions provided in this code. N. Section 38. Power to increase or decrease capital stock, incur, create, or increase bonded indebtedness. No corporation shall increase or decrease its capital stock or incur, create, or increase any bonded indebtedness unless approved by a majority vote of the Board of Directors and, at a stockholders meeting duly called for the purpose, two-thirds, two-thirds, of the outstanding capital stock shall favor the increase or diminution of the capital stock, or the incurring, creating, or increasing of any bonded indebtedness. Written notice of the proposed increase or diminution of the capital stock or of the incurring, creating, or increasing of any bonded indebtedness and of the time and place of the stockholders meeting at which the proposed increase or diminution of the capital stock or the incurring or increasing of any bonded indebtedness is to be considered, must be addressed to each stockholder at his place of residence as shown on the books of the corporation and deposited to the addressee in the post office with postage prepaid, or served personally. A certificate in duplicate must be signed by a majority of the directors of the corporation and countersigned by the chairman and the secretary of the stockholders meeting, setting forth 1. That the requirements of this section have been complied with. 2. The amount of the increase or diminution of the capital stock. 3. If an increase of the capital stock, the amount of capital stock or number of shares of no PAR stock thereof actually subscribed, the names, nationalities and residences of the persons subscribing, the amount of capital stock or number of no PAR stock subscribed by each, and the amount paid by each on his subscription in cash or property, or the amount of capital stock or number of shares of no PAR stock allotted to each stockholder if such increase is for the purpose of making effective stock dividend therefore authorized. 4. 
any bonded indebtedness to be incurred, created, or increased. 5. The actual indebtedness of the corporation on the day of the meeting. 6. The amount of stock represented at the meeting, and 7. The vote authorizing the increase or diminution of the capital stock, or the incurring, creating, or increasing of any bonded indebtedness. Any increase or decrease in the capital stock or the incurring, creating, or increasing of any bonded indebtedness shall require prior approval of the Securities and Exchange Commission. One of the duplicate certificates shall be kept on file in the office of the corporation and the other shall be filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission and attached to the original Articles of Incorporation. From and after approval by the Securities and Exchange Commission and the issuance by the Commission of its Certificate of Filing, the capital stock shall stand increased or decreased and the incurring, creating, or increasing of any bonded indebtedness authorized, as the Certificate of Filing may declare, provided, that the Securities and Exchange Commission shall not accept for filing any certificate of increase of capital stock unless accompanied by the sworn statement of the Treasurer of the Corporation lawfully holding office at the time of the filing of the certificate, showing that at least 25, 25 percent, percent of such increased capital stock has been subscribed and that at least 25, 25 percent, percent of the amount subscribed has been paid either in actual cash to the corporation or that there has been transferred to the corporation property the valuation of which is equal to 25, 25 percent, percent of the subscription, provided, further, that no decrease of the capital stock shall be approved by the Commission if its effect shall prejudice the rights of corporate creditors. Non-stock corporations may incur or create bonded indebtedness, or increase the same, with the approval by a majority vote of the Board of Trustees and of at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the members in a meeting duly called for the purpose. Bonds issued by a corporation shall be registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which shall have the authority to determine the sufficiency of the terms thereof. 17A. Section 39. Power to deny preemptive right. All stockholders of a stock corporation shall enjoy preemptive right to subscribe to all issues or disposition of shares of any class, in proportion to their respective shareholdings, unless such right is denied by the Articles of Incorporation or an amendment thereto, provided that such preemptive right shall not extend to shares to be issued in compliance with laws requiring stock offerings or minimum stock ownership by the public, or to shares to be issued in good faith with the approval of the stockholders representing two-thirds, two-thirds, of the outstanding capital stock, in exchange for property needed for corporate purposes or in payment of a previously contracted debt. Section 40. Sale or other disposition of assets. Subject to the provisions of existing laws on illegal combinations and monopolies, a corporation may, by a majority vote of its board of directors or trustees, sell, lease, exchange, mortgage, pledge or otherwise dispose of all or substantially all of its property and assets, including its goodwill, upon such terms and conditions and for such consideration, which may be money, stocks, bonds, or other instruments for the payment of money or other property or consideration, as its board of directors or trustees may deem expedient, when authorized by the vote of the stockholders representing at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the outstanding capital stock, or in case of non-stock corporation, by the vote of at least to two-thirds, two-thirds, of the members, in a stockholders or members meeting duly called for the purpose. Written notice of the proposed action and of the time and place of the meeting shall be addressed to each stockholder or member at his place of residence as shown on the books of the corporation and deposited to the addressee in the post office with postage prepaid, or served personally, provided, that any dissenting stockholder may exercise his appraisal right under the conditions provided in this code. A sale or other disposition shall be deemed to cover substantially all the corporate property and assets if thereby the corporation would be rendered incapable of continuing the business or accomplishing the purpose for which it was incorporated. After such authorization or approval by the stockholders or members, the board of directors or trustees may, nevertheless, in its discretion, abandon such sale, lease, exchange, mortgage, pledge, or other disposition of property and assets 
subject to the rights of third parties under any contract relating thereto, without further action or approval by the stockholders or members. Nothing in this section is intended to restrict the power of any corporation, without the authorization by the stockholders or members, to sell, lease, exchange, mortgage, pledge or otherwise dispose of any of its property and assets if the same is necessary in the usual and regular course of business of said corporation or if the proceeds of the sale or other disposition of such property and assets be appropriated for the conduct of its remaining business. In non-stock corporations where there are no members with voting rights, the vote of at least a majority of the trustees in office will be sufficient authorization for the corporation to enter into any transaction authorized by this section. Section 41. Power to acquire own shares. A stock corporation shall have the power to purchase or acquire its own shares for a legitimate corporate purpose or purposes, including but not limited to the following cases, provided, that the corporation has unrestricted retained earnings in its books to cover the shares to be purchased or acquired. 1. To eliminate fractional shares arising out of stock dividends. 2. To collect or compromise an indebtedness to the corporation, arising out of unpaid subscription, in a delinquency sale, and to purchase delinquent shares sold during said sale, and 3. To pay dissenting or withdrawing stockholders entitled to payment for their shares under the provisions of this code. A. Section 42. Power to invest corporate funds in another corporation or business or for any other purpose. Subject to the provisions of this code, a private corporation may invest its funds in any other corporation or business or for any purpose other than the primary purpose for which it was organized when approved by a majority of the board of directors or trustees and ratified by the stockholders representing at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the outstanding capital stock, or by at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the members in the case of non-stock corporations, at a stockholders or members meeting. Duly called for the purpose. Written notice of the proposed investment and the time and place of the meeting shall be addressed to each stockholder or member at his place of residence as shown on the books of the corporation and deposited to the addressee in the post office with postage prepaid, or served personally, provided, that any dissenting stockholder shall have appraisal right as provided in this code, provided, however, that where the investment by the corporation is reasonably necessary to accomplish its primary purpose as stated in the Articles of Incorporation, the approval of the stockholders or members shall not be necessary. 171 2A. Section 43. Power to Declare Dividends. The Board of Directors of a stock corporation may declare dividends out of the unrestricted retained earnings which shall be payable in cash, in property, or in stock to all stockholders on the basis of outstanding stock held by them, provided, that any cash dividends due on delinquent stock shall first be applied to the unpaid balance on the subscription plus costs and expenses, while stock dividends shall be withheld from the delinquent stockholder until his unpaid subscription is fully paid, provided, further, that no stock dividend shall be issued without the approval of stockholders representing not less than two-thirds, two-thirds, of the outstanding capital stock at a regular or special meeting duly called for the purpose. 16A. Stock corporations are prohibited from retaining surplus profits in excess of 100, 100 percent, percent of their paid-in capital stock, except, 1 when justified by definite corporate expansion projects or programs approved by the board of directors, or, 2, when the corporation is prohibited under any loan agreement with any financial institution or creditor, whether local or foreign, from declaring dividends without its slash his consent, and such consent has not yet been secured, or, 3, when it can be clearly shown that such retention is necessary under special circumstances obtaining in the corporation, such as when there is need for special reserve for probable contingencies. N. Section 44. Power to enter into management contract. No corporation shall conclude a management contract with another corporation unless such contract shall have been approved by the board of directors and by stockholders owning at least the majority of the outstanding capital stock, 
or by at least a majority of the members in the case of a non-stock corporation, of both the managing and the managed corporation, at a meeting duly called for the purpose, provided, that, 1, where a stockholder or stockholders representing the same interest of both the managing and the managed corporations own or control more than one-third, one-third, of the total outstanding capital stock entitled to vote of the managing corporation, or, 2, where a majority of the members of the board of directors of the managing corporation also constitute a majority of the members of the board of directors of the managed corporation. Then the management contract must be approved by the stockholders of the managed corporation owning at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the total outstanding capital stock entitled to vote, or by at least two-thirds, two-thirds, of the members in the case of a non-stock corporation. No management contract shall be entered into for a period longer than five years for any one term. The provisions of the next preceding paragraph shall apply to any contract whereby a corporation undertakes to manage or operate all or substantially all of the business of another corporation, whether such contracts are called service contracts, operating agreements, or otherwise, provided, however, that such service contracts or operating agreements which relate to the exploration, development, exploitation, or utilization of natural resources may be entered into for such periods as may be provided by the pertinent laws or regulations. N. Section 45. Ultraviaries Acts of Corporations. No corporation under this code shall possess or exercise any corporate powers except those conferred by this code or by its articles of incorporation and except such as are necessary or incidental to the exercise of the powers so conferred. N. Title B. By Laws. Section 46. Adoption of Bylaws. Every corporation formed under this code must, within one, one, month after receipt of official notice of the issuance of its Certificate of Incorporation by the Securities and Exchange Commission, adopt a code of bylaws for its government not inconsistent with this code. For the adoption of bylaws by the corporation the affirmative vote of the stockholders representing at least a majority of the outstanding capital stock, or of at least a majority of the members in case of non-stock corporations, shall be necessary. The bylaws shall be signed by the stockholders or members voting for them and shall be kept in the principal office of the corporation, subject to the inspection of the stockholders or members during office hours. A copy thereof, duly certified to by a majority of the directors or trustees countersigned by the secretary of the corporation, shall be filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission which shall be attached to the original Articles of Incorporation. Notwithstanding the provisions of the preceding paragraph, bylaws may be adopted and filed prior to incorporation, in such case, such bylaws shall be approved and signed by all the incorporators and submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission, together with the Articles of Incorporation. In all cases, bylaws shall be effective only upon the issuance by the Securities and Exchange Commission of a certification that the bylaws are not inconsistent with this code. The Securities and Exchange Commission shall not accept for filing the bylaws or any amendment thereto of any bank, banking institution, building and loan association, trust company, insurance company, public utility, educational institution or other special corporations governed by special laws, unless accompanied by a certificate of the appropriate government agency to the effect that such bylaws or amendments are in accordance with law. 20A. Section 47. Contents of bylaws. Subject to the provisions of the Constitution, this code, other special laws, and the Articles of Incorporation, a private corporation may provide in its bylaws for 1. The time, place, and manner of calling and conducting regular or special meetings of the directors or trustees. 2. The time and manner of calling and conducting regular or special meetings of the stockholders or members. 3. The required quorum in meetings of stockholders or members and the manner of voting therein. 4. The form for proxies of stockholders and members and the manner of voting them. 5. The qualifications, duties, and compensation of directors or trustees, officers and employees. 6. 
the time for holding the annual election of directors of trustees and the mode or manner of giving notice thereof. 7. The manner of election or appointment and the term of office of all officers other than directors or trustees. 8. The penalties for violation of the bylaws. 9. In the case of stock corporations, the manner of issuing stock certificates, and 10. Such other matters as may be necessary for the proper or convenient transaction of its corporate business and affairs. 21A. Section 48. Amendments to bylaws. The board of directors or trustees, by a majority vote thereof, and the owners of at least a majority of the outstanding capital stock, or at least a majority of the members of a non-stock corporation, at a regular or special meeting duly called for the purpose, may amend or repeal any bylaws or adopt new bylaws. The owners of two-thirds, two-thirds, of the outstanding capital stock or two-thirds, two-thirds, of the members in a non-stock corporation may delegate to the board of directors or trustees the power to amend or repeal any bylaws or adopt new bylaws, provided that any power delegated to the board of directors or trustees to amend or repeal any bylaws or adopt new bylaws shall be considered as revoked whenever stockholders owning or representing a majority of the outstanding capital stock or a majority of the members in non-stock corporations shall so vote at a regular or special meeting. Whenever any amendment or new bylaws are adopted, such amendment or new bylaws shall be attached to the original bylaws in the office of the corporation, and a copy thereof, duly certified under oath by the corporate secretary and a majority of the directors or trustees, shall be filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission the same to be attached to the original articles of incorporation and original bylaws. The amended or new bylaws shall only be effective upon the issuance by the Securities and Exchange Commission of a certification that the same are not inconsistent with this code. 22A and 23A